This meeting is being recorded. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Howard Isaacson, and I'm a professional research astronomer at the University of California, Berkeley. My co-organizer, Faye Dye, who works at the California Institute of Technology, uh, and I have brought you together, a talented group of graduate students and researchers from around the US and around the world, to teach you their skills and show you the tools that you will need as future astronomers. Today and in this course, we are gathered together from places far and wide and in order to share our knowledge and learn new things about one of the most fascinating topics in science, exoplanet astronomy. Over the next eight weeks, we will display and discuss some of the fundamental tools used by professional researchers. And our hope is that with these tools in hand, you'll be well positioned to obtain your first research opportunity in astronomy. So before we begin today, I would like you to have all of our mentors say hello and give a brief introduction. And after that, uh, I'll provide a brief outline of how the course will be run, and then we'll move on to the tutorial part of today's class. So Faye, why don't you go ahead and go first. Hey everyone, welcome to the workshop. Uh, I'm currently a postdoc at Caltech. You'll hear more about me later in the mental profile today. Thanks, Faye. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Joey Murphy. I'm a second year graduate student at UC Santa Cruz. Um, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you guys. Hey everyone, my name is Shetan and I'm a postback uh, research intern right now at Asia Taiwan. I'm from India and great to have you all here. Priya, would you like to go next? Oh, you're on mute, you gotta unmute yourself. There you go. Hi everyone, I'm Priya Hassan. I'm a professor at uh, a university in India, and I'm happy here to be mentoring you all. Thank you. All right, Isaac, you're up next. Hi everyone, Hi. my name is Isaac. I'm a third year grad student at the University of Michigan. I did this course last year too, and it was a lot of fun. I hope you all enjoy. Thanks for coming back. Emily, you're next. Hello, welcome to this workshop. My name is Emily. I am a first year master's student from the University of California, Riverside, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thanks, Emily. Corey. Hi, all. My name is Corey Beard. I'm a third year, finishing up my third year, starting my fourth year at University of California, Irvine. Thanks, Corey. Jack. Hi, everyone. I'm Jack. Uh, I'm also a third year going to fourth at University of California, Irvine. And Alex. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Alex. I'm a second year going on to third year graduate student at the University of Kansas, and I'm very happy to work with you all for the next few weeks. Thanks all. Now that you've met our mentors, um, I'll just say a couple more things and then we'll get we'll be officially starting here. So let's see, you'll have a chance to hear from our mentors uh, on technical, technical topics as they'll be leading the tutorials each week. At the end of each lecture, you'll have a chance to hear two profiles of our mentors to have a little get to know you. Uh, as they share their stories about how they made their way into astronomy, you may find some similarities with your own paths and be inspired that way. So I'm going to quickly do a screen share uh, outlining the course and some of the technical details about how we're going to organize things, and then we'll jump right into the tutorials. All right, I'm sharing a screen here. This is the Intro to Astro 2021 uh, GitHub repository. This is all open source um, software and open source material that we're gonna use to organize the course. Um, each week is broken down into a different folder. Uh, below, there's an overview of the course. If you haven't looked at the, at the website yet, go ahead and give it a, a view. Uh, on week one, we have a couple of um, tutorials that we'll be going through. We'll be going through uh, Unix and Git, uh, we'll be talking about Python and Jupyter, and then we'll be having a guide to doing to how to read technical papers. Uh, the purpose for this is that every week we'll have an assigned paper for you to read, and then someone will present that paper, one of the mentors will, in order to um, help give you an idea, a little bit more in-depth analysis of those, of those papers. Um, we also have uh, Pia the Piazza platform available. So um, please um, use this to ask questions about the different tutorials that are online, uh, ask questions to the mentors about um, how they got into astronomy or some questions like that. And um, I prefer if you use Piazza over email because uh, we all have an opportunity to um, answer the questions if you post them here. There'll also be random postings about videos that we like or um, different kind of lectures that are recorded online that we want to point you to. So keep an eye out 
uh, on Piazza and you can adjust your uh, email uh, options accordingly to get as much as many updates as you'd like. All right, um, stop share. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand off to our first presenter, Joey Murphy. Thanks, Howard. And hey, everyone. Yeah, so my name is Joey Murphy, and I am, like I mentioned, a second year graduate student at UC Santa Cruz, uh, interested in exoplanets. And today, to sort of start off the summer, I'll be doing a quick introduction on uh, two sort of related and essential uh, tools uh, or topics that you should be familiar with. Um, because they'll really help you in terms of uh, scientific computing and, and getting into research. So this might be a bit of a review for some of you, um, but that's okay. Uh, there's always, always uh, more to learn, always good to hear these things again. And it's gonna be lightning fast and I won't be able to explain everything about these two topics in uh, 15 minutes, but there are plenty of resources on the web and Google is your friend. And uh, you'll also practice some of the skills that we'll talk about and, and learn about new ones that we didn't have a chance to cover today um, with the assignments uh, that you'll do this week. Okay, so, uh, so I'm gonna be talking about Unix and Git. And um, just to start off, uh, what is Unix? Well, it's, you might've heard uh, people mention Unix before or uh, Linux. Uh, these are, uh, Unix is the first uh, portable operating system, essentially. It was developed back in the 70s. And uh, by portable, I mean that it is able to be distributed on different or used across different computing platforms. So uh, someone using, um, you know, iOS, for example, could use it. Somebody using Android could also run Unix. And that's because it's written in the C programming language which makes it uh, portable, but also very fast. And uh, like I mentioned, there are, are today many, uh, many Unix-like alternatives, uh, including Linux. So you'll hear, uh, you might hear people, people mention some of these things. Basically, uh, Unix is an operating system and I'll be using Mac OS as sort of an example today because that's what I use, but, um, Unix is an operating system, so it basically facilitates the interaction on your local machine with uh, between the software and the hardware. So the way we interact with Unix is via a shell. And so uh, Mac, for example, uses Bash or uh, other more recent releases of Mac OS uh, use a different shell called C shell. And there's an application on Mac, for example, called Terminal that provides a command line interface for passing commands to Unix and then getting output um, from your machine. So this is kind of like the lowest level way to interact with your computer's operating system. And I'll show, uh, we'll go through some examples of how to do this in a second. Uh, but I could even do this. I, I wrote these slides up in a Jupyter notebook, which you'll learn about in just a minute. But I can even do this in uh, these Jupyter notebook cells by invoking this bash magic command. And so here is a common Unix command that you'll probably end up using all the time. PWD, which prints your working directory. And it basically tells you where in the whole file system of your computer are you currently located. Similarly, uh, there's a command ls that you'll use all the time, which lists the contents of your current working directory. So, so it lists, I, here I have some subdirectory called images and then uh, this, this IPython notebook and the HTML file containing the slides. Okay, so, so we're interacting with Unix by passing it command line uh, arguments. And this is just a screenshot of what that would look like in terminal, but um, we'll, we'll go through and do a live example in just a second. Okay, so I'm gonna just cover right now a, a handful of 
sort of essential Unix commands that are good to know. Don't worry about memorizing them all right now. You can go back and refer to these slides later. And also, if you just Google Unix, uh, Unix commands cheat sheet or something, you'll get a ton of results of very helpful uh, PDFs that you can just uh, save or print out and tape right above your desktop uh, so, you, so you never forget. But so we already, we already covered sort of uh, these two basic ones, PWD and LS, which kind of shows you where you are and, and what's around you and, and orients yourself uh, within your computer's uh, file directory or file uh, tree. Um, other, other useful commands include uh, the manual command. So man uh, will tell you, it'll give you useful information on if you have questions about how a command works. So if you want to understand um, some of the different options you can pass to ls, for example, you can do man ls, and then it'll give you a useful uh, documentation page with examples of how to use that command. And then now that we've found out where we are in our computers, file um, system, you can use the CD command change directory uh, to move around within that system. So for example, if we had some subdirectory called data and we wanted to go in there and look around at all the data files we collected on our most recent observing run, we would change directory CD into data. Okay. Uh, with Unix, you can interact with um, and move around files. So this is sort of like uh, if you use a Mac, just like the Finder application, uh, except that you're doing it all from the command line. So you, you're not even you're not doing it with a graphical user interface. You're just using it, uh, making all of these changes and making these commands from the command line. Uh, but I won't I won't uh, just read read off the read the words off the page here. But I will note that. Because you're working a little more closely to uh, the uh, operating system than through an application like Finder, for example, on Mac, uh, if you delete something, it's a lot harder to, in many, many cases, you can't recover uh, what you deleted. Unlike in Finder, where if you put something in the trash, you can go back and, and grab it. So just be careful. <laughs> and then you can use Unix commands to do uh, more complicated things like search for substrings in different files. And you can also even combine uh, Unix commands with um, the pipe operator, for example. So the pipe operator can send the output from one command like ls and send that to, to be the input for another command like grep. So a uh, a useful example I always have for using grep and the pipe operator is when I'm checking if I've already installed a Python package or if I need to install it. So I'll do something like pip freeze pipe grep and then the Python package that I want to look for or, or something like if you're using conda, conda list, grep. And then that'll tell you what version of that Python package you have if it's already been installed. Okay. And more, more Unix commands for uh, writing to or inspecting files from the command line, which can be convenient. And um, as we'll work in an example in a minute, uh, this can be useful if you're doing repetitive tasks and you need to combine these uh, commands in a script, for example, uh, if you're writing enumerated output or something to, to file and you don't want to do that all by hand. So, Okay, um, like I said, I'm just going to breeze through all of these real quick and you can go back and refer to the slides uh, afterwards, but let's just see some of these commands in action. So I have this little exercise for myself that um, you can all follow along with. And so our objective here is to just create some new directory named foo underscore dir. We'll cd into that directory write a hello world message in a text file uh, from the command line show the contents of that text file, make a copy of it, and then place the copy in a new subdirectory. Okay, so uh, a couple different steps there, but let's see um, let's see if we can do it. What it looks like in Unix. Okay, 
So here we go. First thing I'm gonna do, I, I always kind of try to orient myself here. I'm just gonna print my uh, working directory to see where I'm at. Okay, this is the path uh, of my current working directory and that, that looks uh, good to me. And also LS just to see what's already in here. So some slides, um, some subdirectories that aren't super important right now, but okay, this, this all looks good. So the first thing to do is to create a new directory named Fooder. So I'm going to do make dir, dir. Now, if I do ls, and I'm going to append these uh, additional options to it just to give myself a nicely formatted output, I see Fooder uh, is now a subdirectory that we just created. And these different options, you can you can read about them on the ls man page. But l gives us this long extended output. T sorts everything by the time it was last edited, and R makes sure the newest thing is at the bottom. Okay, so now we're going to CD into Fooder. And we are going to write a hello, wor hello world uh, text file from the command line. So I remember there is uh, this command called cat, and then the greater than, greater than operator, let's call the text file uh, foo.txt. And now uh, cat plus the greater than, greater than symbol will take input from us directly from standard input. So we just type right here, I'll hit enter and then control D to get out. And now let's see if uh, uh, that actually worked. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I'm just using the more command to display the contents of the foo.txt file and it looks like it worked, great. Okay, so now uh, the next step is to make a copy of this text file. Let's just check. Uh, yeah, this is the only uh, file in our current working directory right now. So we'll do cp foo.txt, and let's just call it foo copy. And now if I do ls again, we have both foo and foo copy, and foo copy should say the same thing. And now we're going to place that copy in a new subdirectory. So make their uh, foo sub there. And then move to copy. CD in the foo sub there. LS, there's our copy there. Okay. Cool. Okay. So there we go. So just some uh, an example of uh, working with some Unix commands there. Uh, okay. Uh, so I, I mentioned this um, previously, but but one benefit of knowing how to interact with Unix via the command line, um, one of the main uh, benefits is that you can write these things called shell scripts to sort of combine all these commands together. And these can automate repetitive tasks, sort of like you know, if you have to write um, text to a file that's enumerated. So uh, the syntax for uh, this shell script, in this case, it's a bash script because I'm, I'm working in a bash shell, um, is slightly different than uh, what you'd see for Python. So maybe this for loop looks a little weird. Um, but we can write something like this. So let's let's write this real quick. Um, let's get this up. I'm gonna open up this text editor, and let's call it the script. So we're in a for loop. Do and now you can. I'll let you on your own try to think about what this um, script will. Output before I run it. Save that and exit the text editor. And now uh, I actually have to make for the shell script, I have to make it um, executable. So I'm just going to. This command chmod 
and you can, I'll let you Google that one on your own. All right, and now foo script is executable. You can see these, uh, this kind of code here has changed. These exits tell us that the script is executable. I'll use dot slash to run it. And let's see what happens. Okay, we got all these txt files. Let's see. Okay, cool. That works. Okay. So those are some basic uh, Unix commands and, and some very basic uh, shell scripting for you. Um, I know I am running up on time here, right, Howard? Yeah. Um, you're, you're good. You can, you can leave it there. You can talk for a couple more minutes, whichever you like. Um, maybe I will, uh, just in the sake of time, maybe I'll leave it here and then, because this is a good stopping point for Unix. Um, and then uh, everyone, the, the assignment for the, the Git tutorial on software carpentry is, is pretty comprehensive. So hopefully um, that will. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Joey. Uh, yeah, great good place to stop. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Joey. That was great. Uh, I'll do a little transition now. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody, uh, with each tutorial, there's an associated um, assignment. And so you have extra time uh, offline to go and practice those. The ones for this week come from a software carpentry website, which is has some really nice tutorials to get you uh, more practice about how to use the command line and also how to use our next topic, uh, which is Jupyter and Python. And um, while Shatan is uh, doing his screen share and getting it up. I'll just note that there's some questions coming in. Um, feel free to ask more questions on the Q&A uh, button. We'll do our best to answer them. If we don't get to them, please follow up on um, Piazza. And uh, you know, these just to say one more one more thing, which is you know, these are really powerful tools: the command line interface, and then what's what we're going to show you with with Python. They're tools that we use every single day um, because they have so much flexibility and 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 power and ability to just give us the, the things we need sort of right away. There's lots of different ways to do the types of things that Joey was showing, for example, but um, these are the, we think these are the skills that are the most important for, for researchers. So take it away. Thank you, you did. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shetan, and I hope you can see my screen now. So, uh, I'll be just talking about what is Python and Jupyter notebooks now. And I'll be telling you in very layman terms about Python, um, about text editors, Jupyter notebooks, and also platforms like Colab and Jupyter Lab. And then we'll be moving on to the software carpentry workshop that just Howard and uh, talked about. So this is the main aim for this tutorial. So that is your assignment as well. So like starting off, what is Python itself? So uh, like uh, we just saw Unix and it was an operating system and the shell scripts were the kind of fate for us to interact with the operating system. But Python uh, here is a bit different. So Python is a very high level programming language. So it can also be used for many computing tasks. And it has a particular syntax, just like Unix. So if I want to like say, uh, write my name on the screen, I'll just simply go and write print and then use uh, these parentheses and these uh, inverted commas and then write my name. So this is a very particular syntax that I have to follow to get my name on my screen. And then there are statement groupings in Python so that just like Joey just showed you that we used a for loop and uh, the statements were grouped using indentations and new lines. And also new commands are used using new lines. So this is about how we write Python, but what exactly is Python is, it's a high level programming language and why, why is it so? So there are two basic reasons. So one of it is that it's an object oriented programming language. So it is to say in simple words that it, we can make objects that are reproducible and that makes our codes more structured. And that has some certain set of properties that we can use. 
and secondly it is an interpreted language and this is something that you'll be hearing about a lot going on so this means that python takes one line of code that we write at a time and then it converts it into a machine language and then it uh, executes that line before going on to the next line so this is how interpreted languages work this is in opposition to the compiled languages that are c c++ or java if you have heard about them so those take all the commands at once, convert it, convert them all at machine code that the computer understands and then execute them all at once. Then what is exactly the difference between the Unix scripts and Python scripts? So Unix script like directly communicates with the operating system as Joy just told you, but Python adds in a huge level of abstraction so that like uh, we can make code that is more complex for uh for the computation and for the functionalities but it is easier for us to write than unix so it is a very powerful and diverse language so i'll just uh like i have made this uh jupyter notebook so that you can all read about this uh in more detail and i have also had many like i have also included many uh, links so that you can read more in, into more detail so i'll just be going ahead with the anaconda distribution so howard mailed you that we'll need an anaconda distribution and if you have not already downloaded it, you can download it using these links or these um, documentation would be very helpful for you if you are stuck somewhere, or you can always ask your questions on Piazza. But what is exactly a distribution? So for that, we'll need to understand what are functions, modules and packages in Python. So a block of commands in Python that is written together, it takes an input, it does something like it does a task and it returns an output this whole thing this block of commands can be called a function in python for example the print statement that we just used it is a function that takes in my name or a number or anything as an input and it does this task of printing that onto my screen and it also outputs a number based on if it was successful or it was it if it it wasn't successful if we uh, combine a lot of these functions or blocks of commands into a uh, file a python file it's called a module so these functions may have a like similar purpose let's say that i want to print something to my screen i also want to input something from my screen to the python so these all can be grouped together into a module and a collection of these modules is called a package so python already has a lot of packages in uh, in itself so there are like several built-in packages for python However, the power of Python lies in that we can always expand this set and we can use other people's code as well. So that is called the open source code. And these third party codes are always distributed through the distributor. So these distributions are quite literal in their terms. And Anaconda is one of them. So Anaconda packs in several of these packages and modules into one distribution so that we don't have to install them all separately. And we can just go ahead with our Pythons and their, uh, and like, you know, we can do the astronomical data analysis very easily without having to install a lot of libraries individually. Further, there is one more use for uh, Jupyter for the Anaconda distribution is like it creates virtual spaces for you to work on. So these are the virtual environments and these are just isolated spaces so that you can keep your project separately and do not mess anything up with the installation. So you can have different installations of Python on these different workspaces itself. Now let's go on and I'll be just showing you a quick demo of how we can use the terminal to use Python like we just uh, saw with the Unix. So here, am I, here I am in my uh, like uh, terminal and here you can see there is something uh, written like base. So this tells me that I have installed a conda distribution. This can be an anaconda distribution or a mini conda distribution, both are fine. And if I write Python over here to start the Python, I can see that I have Python 3.8 and there's this anaconda distribution so i'm in in python and now if let's say if i have to again print my name on the my, on my screen i will just write this function print chetan and here it is so this is the output so great the python is working fine but what else can we do with this so let's say that i want to add two numbers so let's say i'll just do one plus two and it gives me the output three now if I want to import a package, so let's import a package OS that is an inbuilt package of Python. So it imported this package and I can now use a, 
command that is a function that is uh, in this package. So I'll just use something similar to just Joey used. So I want to get my current working directory. So I can get it using a function called get CWD. Notice there are no inputs for this function. That means this is an implicit function. So it does not need any input to get me my current working directory. And when I press enter, so it gives me that, okay, I'm in this particular directory. So this is how we use Python on command line. But let's say that I want to now uh, move on to something uh, like scripts. So I want to use some scripts over my, uh, so like, uh, let's say that I want to write 10 of these commands together and do not have to write these individually one by one and go on through them. For that, I can just use, I can just make a Python file. And for that, I can use a text editor. So this can be a notepad, <clears> the <throat> text editor on Unix or a command prompt on Windows, uh, both are fine. But I need something that is more easier for me to understand and it color codes the things and it can also do some additional functionality. So for that, uh, we use something called text editors in uh, and uh, for writing these scripts and codes. And Sublime is one of them, and you can always use others as well. But Sublime is a very simple text editor, and I'll just show you this in a second. So here I have a Sublime text open, and I have written a simple code that has two variables, A and B. So variables are just basically spaces in our memory that takes on a name, that is A and B here, and takes on a number, so or takes on a value, seven or three, or it can be a name as well, a string. And then I want to do some arithmetic operations such as sum, difference, division, and multiplication on these. I just write this all in a text editor and save it as a Python file. What advantage of text editor we can see is first of all, it color codes things so it is easier for us to read this code. Secondly, it also gives you us different build system so we can use different languages. And then we can also build this code or you know uh, execute this code on the text editor itself. So you can see that the output is over here. So I can directly use this text editor to execute the codes. But now let's say that I want to go the conventional way and use my terminal to uh, you know, execute this code. So I'll just write Python and then the code name. So it was intro.py and dot .py is the extension for Python codes. So it does the same thing. It gives me the outputs, right? Um, so this is what text editors are. But now let's move on to something more interactive. So something where I can write some text uh, also and so also include some images. So that is what Jupyter Notebooks are. So let's go on ahead with the Jupyter Notebooks. So what you were seeing earlier, it was a Jupyter Notebook in itself. So these are just interactive uh, notebooks that we can write some code into all, and also include some text, some headings, some subheadings and some images also here. So to open one, uh, we can just go onto the terminal and write Jupyter Notebook. Notice we are outside of Python right now to open this. So this opens up in my browser and it is a, it is locally hosted. So it is not on the internet. And this shows me my uh, current working directories, folders and subfolders. So it gives me my folder structure. And if I want to just go on and use a uh, already existing um, file, uh, a Python notebook file that is interactive Python notebook file, IPY and file, I can just go on and click over here. But for now, let's say that I want to make a new one. So I'll just go ahead and click on this new button and select the version that I want. So I will use the base Conda version. And here I am. So I have a new notebook. On the top, we have the name of this notebook. So let's say that it's intro to Python. And now let's say that I want to just uh, write some code over here. So this is a cell block uh, and I can write any code that I want. So let's say that I want to print high. I can write this over here and it I can execute this code using this button run or using the shortcuts that are shift plus enter. I can also make some text over here. So let me add a new uh, cell using this plus button and move this up over here. So I can, this is a text. And then I'll just convert this type of the cell from here, from code to markdown and press shift plus enter or press the run button. And I can make a text like this. Now, if I want to make it a heading or subheading, I'll just use hashtags in the front 
So this is a heading. Um, and here I get a heading. If I want a subheading or a sub subheading, I'll just keep on adding these hashtags. So this will just make these the size smaller and smaller. So this is how we can use uh, an, an interactive Python notebook or a Jupyter notebook. Now let's just copy paste the code. So I have here copy pasted the code that we just ran over there. And if I run this code, we can see that we get the same output over here that we got on our uh, files, on our command prompt or on our text editor. And now let's say that I want to use these same variables A and B over my whole notebook and want to do something different. So I'll just have a new cell and uh, calculate the remainder. So I just calculated A percentage B, which is the remainder operator in Python and in any language. Uh, so it gives the remainder. That means that A and B is known to the whole notebook. And I can also like import libraries. And if I were to check how to like uh, see what is a particular functions functionality, I can just use, use this um, question mark on front of the uh, function name and it gives me what, uh, what input does it take, what output does it take and what is the function exactly doing. So it gives me the documentation that I need. Uh, moving on ahead. So let's see, let's just see the power of Python. We just talked about how powerful Python is. So I have made these two blocks of code here. And these are just, you can see that these are around 20 lines of code. And we are just doing some small thing in Python and to show that how powerful Python is. So you do not need to understand everything that goes on in this code. It is just to show you like what the power of Python is. We will be discussing exactly this in week three. You also have a bonus assignment based on this. So don't worry if you don't under, understand everything over here, but here I am importing the libraries first, and then I am taking in 20,000 rows of data with 97 columns. So you can already see that this is a huge chunk of data that I am all loading into my Python and I'm loading in into a variable. And then I'm plotting. This is the closest 20,000 stars that I got from the Gaia data archive. And I'm plotting these based on the right ascension and declination, which are just the positional coordinates of the stars on the sky. And as you can see, uh, if I press run, it runs in less than a second on my uh, computer and it plots all these stars. And let's move on ahead and just uh, use more power of this Python. So here I am just plotting the same thing in 3D and it is interactive. So if I run this code, this also takes less than a second and I can see that I have plotted some stars. So these are just stars that are uh, plotted with a right ascension declination and as well as distance from the earth. And these are color coded based on their effective stellar temperature as an analog and they are sized according to their radius. So as you can see, I can also interact with this. I can zoom in over here. I can just tilt it so that I can see how these are very like varying with the RA index or the distance. So this is just a small example, like how powerful Python is and we can always write 10 lines of code and execute it in less than a second to have something incredibly great like this. So moving on to the next part, um, this is about Google Colab and Jupyter Lab. So Google Colab and Jupyter Lab, these both are uh, two internet interfaces for using these Jupyter notebooks. So I have opened up Google Colab over here. So this is uh, obviously provided by Google, Google and we can open our Jupyter notebooks over here or make our new notebooks over this. So we don't, the main benefit of this is that we do not need any, uh, you know, any uh, resource from our own uh, local computer. We do not need to install anything on our local computer. We can just use it on the internet and it just connects it. It just, uh, it also gives you some RAM and some disk space on the internet. And we can just run our uh, code. So here is just a small uh, example notebook by Google itself. So you can just uh, check this out. This comes in first. And if I run this code, it will just uh, load my output into, into the same notebook. So I, as you can see, it just multiplied this these numbers. And we can also add our files over here. So we can upload our files and do some processing over here. We get some RAM and disk on the uh, cloud. So you can also check these uh, out, uh, like what RAM and disk you are getting. And also you can upgrade it, but that's a paid version. And similar is Jupyter Lab. So, okay, I 
think I need to refresh this. Yeah. So Jupyter Lab is something provided by the project Jupyter. It also does the same thing and it gives you a Jupyter notebook on the internet. And you can also use it similar to Google Collaboratory. So whatever you prefer. This is more uh, in a format like a Jupyter notebook, but it has the same things. So I guess it is taking some time. So you can check this out on your own. I have included those links in the uh, notebook. And the last part is the software data carpentry. So this is your assignment. You can just go onto this website and you can see that they have told you like a particular example of loading data for patients and then doing some analysis to plot the graphs. And th this goes on from very scratch. So if you do not know Python, you can uh, like start from here as well so they'll tell you what variables are and so on and in the end of this uh, whole thing so you'll uh, your main assignment that you will need to deliver is you can save each of the plots that you make with this assignment and save those in your google drive folder or the folder that howard will just uh, i guess we do not have uh, google drive folders right Howard? so we don't have google yeah. drive folders but um you can definitely create your own with your with your gmail account right so yeah so that's what it was. So, but yeah, you can always go ahead with this uh, particular code. And then there's just this, this bonus. You can try running this on your own. So that would be all. Thank you so much. That was just wonderful. There was a lot that was covered here. Uh, these are some really powerful tools that we use every day. I ran Python from the command line today. I opened Jupyter Notebooks on my local machine and on remote machines today. It's just incredibly relevant for you. Um, be sure to go back and watch this video again once it's posted if you have questions follow along on the this these documents that are on the github repo and post your questions to piazza all right thanks very much that was just fantastic and now we're going to move on to our next part of the uh, next tutorial which is how to read technical papers and find papers of interest to you and for that i'm going to hand off to priya So thanks, Howard. Uh, okay. So uh, it's fine, right? Everyone's audible. There's an echo at the moment. Yeah. I think it's fine, right? Now. Yeah. Better. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I'm now going to be talking about something slightly different, which is actually how do I look for scientific papers, right? And uh, Okay, so uh, so the repository which actually has scientific papers is called the Astrophysics Data System, uh, with or the ADS. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> yeah, so first of all, uh, I mean this is but obvious, but I've just mentioned it that why do we actually publish, right? Basically, because you want to transfer information. And for centuries, uh, you had a last body of uh, scholarly literature available. But now scientific literature is much better organized in the form of electronic media, which actually gives you capabilities to intelligently do data mining, discover patterns, and actually query it in a very uh, effective way, right? So there is what is called the ADS, the Astrophysics Data System, which is uh, uh, you know, supported by, by NASA, by SAO. And it is actually a digital library portal for researchers in astronomy and physics, which is operated by the, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory at Boston, right? So this is at the center of astrophysics, which actually holds the, the center for all this. And it has 15 million records of various publications, um, which include astronomy, astrophysics, physics, data science, and includes all archive reprints. So I'll also briefly talk about archive reprints. Um, this is one of a very interest, uh, important repository of articles where you also have pub, uh, articles pre-published. Once they are accepted, an author can actually upload their articles onto the archives. So it, it gets accessible to people before the publication. And as well as you could have a lot of other uh, sources which are just directly published on the archives. They may not be published into regular articles also. And uh, these are organized in a very well way where you have the abstract, the full text, et cetera. And uh, so uh, when you're actually querying it, you actually have two forms. One is the classic one and the modern one. So the classic one is what was, all, it was there obviously, uh, which has limited capabilities, but um, 
though the, the modern one has already been introduced, there's still a lot of people who are comfortable only with the classic one. And that's how the classic one is also available. So the modern one is actually the one that you, you guys should actually move on to because uh, that has a lot of capabilities. So um, the classic one was announced to be going away a long time back, but um, it, it's still, there's still a lot of people who uh, support it. And I'm actually, I'll show you an interactive session where we actually use the form and uh, this thing as well as the modern form, which has more functionalities and features and uh, we'll talk. So, so I'll first show you these things and then we'll actually run it. So the classic form, which was the one which was originally there, you can actually search for a paper by giving the author's name or say the object, if you know the astronomical name of the object, say a galaxy M51 or something, publication dates, the titles, you could search for it with an and or key. So depending upon uh, how, you, how much of information you know about the paper, you can actually use that. And uh, uh, so this is the, the classic form. Uh, you can actually give it in this way. So for example, here I've, uh, there's an example where I've given my own name, say given a certain object, a certain, this is star cluster. So I've given this thing, I've given a larger uh, you know, publication date range even before I was born. And uh, when you actually run it, it'll actually give you whatever it has found, which are authored by me, which have this object, which is 1960, right? So you will have this kind of a result thing which comes out from the thing. Uh, the modern one actually uh, has uh, uh, more capabilities in the sense here, you could search for your article using the author name, using the year, using you know all these uh, various buttons which are there over here. You can use these to actually find your uh, the, the paper. So for example, there's an example over here with some uh, searches. This is the default one which is available on the website. And you can see that over here, you will actually, it will hit on all to the results which are there. The interesting thing, which we'll see it when I do the, uh, the, the live one, is you can see that this actually gives you various, um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of analytics on the object itself. For example, what were the results available, the citations, the reads, et cetera. So you will know what to actually focus on, right? So for example, if you hit on, one of the, uh, say this article, which is the spectral energy distributions of active galactic nuclei in the Cosmos survey. If you went in for this, you will actually see that you will actually get a whole listing for it in the sense for this particular article, you can see what were the citations, what were the references for this article. Uh, I hope it's clear what's the difference between this. These are uh, the references in the article that the article has referred to. And the citations are people who have actually used this article for their work, right? So you can actually see this. It also tells you what are the data products. Sometimes, for example, supposing in this paper, you actually did spectral energy distributions or SEDs for these objects. So these would already, uh, so you have objects like this. So some of them can be accessed using these various data sources, right? So there is the NED, uh, there's the SIMBA. These are different data sources where you can actually get astronomical data form. So if I want to see the outputs of this paper, right, for various objects, I can actually use these data products to actually, uh, you know, get this data, download it and analyze it if I want to, or do whatever I want to this thing, as well as associated work. So in this sense, what happens is, it gives you everything you would want to need to know about this paper particularly, right? The third option is paper form, which is a very simple one, is that if you actually know which paper you are looking for, you don't need to go in for all these details of the classic modern form, et cetera. But here, for example, if you actually know what was the publication, for example, the year, the volume, et cetera, you directly search for it over here. So you don't have to look around for uh, you know, other sources of data. Uh, so uh, for example, I've uh, just given another example over here. Uh, we'll see it in the live also. This is uh, the kind of queries you will get, right? So we'll, we'll go on to that in a minute. And this is the archive form. I'll show that to you also in, in, uh, in this thing. And um, the other important feature, which I will also show you in the demo would be making your own library. So for example, in the ADS, what happens is once you get into research, you will see that you will actually get lost in the amount of papers available on a particular area, right? So at the ADS, you can have your own login 
And with your own login, you can actually add a library of your own where you can categorize it into, for example, here, I've made a category called Gaia Machine Learning. And I can use this to actually add on papers to this thing from which I can, you know, sort out my references so that I can do it in a better way. So uh, <clears throat> another thing is that uh, all this literature is also linked to what are called virtual observatory tools, which we we'll cover later on, where you can directly use the data which you got from these papers, etc., to plot as well as uh, do some analysis on, right? So I will stop with this. And instead now I will start on with uh, another share, which would be is I would uh, share it on my browser. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, let's go here. And uh, so I will actually show you the website, which I was talking about. So you'll go to ads.howard.edu, okay? This is the website where you have the ADS hosted, right? So um, this is the ADS and uh, and I'm just waiting for a minute for it to load. So essentially over here, what you'll see is uh, what I was showing you, the classic form, the modern form, as well as the paper form. And uh, <clears throat> you could use that to actually query your data. I don't know why is my, uh, this not working. Um, perhaps just use the, um, perhaps use the new, the new one, which is the ui.ads.harvard.edu. That's the, the modern. I'm not too sure why this is happening like this, but just give me a minute. I'll, yeah, okay. I think it should come down. I think the issue might the be the problem with live demos that sometimes there is an issue. Uh, yeah, I think it might be that uh, we, the the new one is preferred. So that the, with the UI dot ADS to I'm a little confused as to why this is happening. So uh, <clears throat> maybe I can. Uh, so the, this thing is actually shared with you all on GitHub. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So great. So here you can see this is a classic form which I was talking to you about, or the modern form. So I'll talk about the modern one because, like I said, that's what you all need to be familiar with. So uh, you can actually, you can see that there's, there are recommendations over here. This is basically showing you the, um, the, 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 the syntax, which you have to actually use if you are trying to use this, right? So uh, you will use it like this. And let's say you search. So I, I take in, let me take an author search. So I've taken in this author search and you could actually search for it and, uh, you can see here it's showing me all what I showed you in the in the display itself, which is showing me actually all the uh, the files which are there, um, authored by this author, right? And like I said, it's actually showing me the publications which were done here by refereed and non-refereed publications of the same author. I can see the numbers over here. I can actually even see the citations that how have the citations changed for this. Uh, we'll not go into the details of what's H index, et cetera, but it is a measure of citations. It also shows you the amount of reads which have been there for various papers. Uh, you can actually, uh, like I showed you, for example, we got into this single publication. You can click onto this and actually see the various data products or the things associated with it. For example, if I want to see the citations, people who have used this paper, I can see it in this way. For example, I see that this paper has used it, it's a new paper. So I can actually now query into this paper and uh, actually see things. You can see, uh, you can see that this paper has, uh, there is an access to the publisher, but the publisher one is often a paid one. So if you do not belong to a place where there's a paid subscription, then the advantage is you can then look for the archives, which I was talking to you about. You can go for the archives and the archives is free. So you can actually click on this and from here, you will get access to the article 
as it is from the archive. This is pre sub pre. Uh, uh, this is an accepted article. This is pre publication. So you can actually have a look at uh, what is it available over here, right? And uh, so now what you see is it's loading from the archives. So the art archive article has everything that's there for the final publication. The only difference is basically the formatting. But otherwise, all the information which is there in the final article is present on the archives. So specifically for people who belong to places where you do not have a paid subscription, which is expensive, the archives is your savior, which actually gives you access to everything. And that's what we essentially use. So here you see, this is the archive article. Uh, <clears throat> this has been accepted in astronomy and astrophysics, and you can actually see everything available over here. So it's all available from here, because you can download it and take it and read it, right? And um, so that's your access to uh, this. Uh, similarly, if I want to actually have a look at any of the data, I can check on the data also from here, right? So I'll go back over here. I think I'm running out of time. So I will just hurry up and um, the archives, the website is given to you all. Uh, the other thing is, um, I'll just go on to this. And um, over here, you can see is you can actually, you sign up, you can sign up and have a sign up for yourself to create your own account, giving your email address as well as a password. This is very simple. You re-enter the password. And once you log in, right, with your details, for example, you see, I already have a login. So I will log in with my details. You can see over here, I, I have my account. And over here, I can actually, um, you know, have access to my, um, what you say, to my library, where I can actually put my things as I want. So uh, this is it. I think I should stop over here, right? I've already over shot. Whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready. Yep. So y'all finished? That was wonderful. So um, I was using ADS earlier today. I added some uh, papers to my library. I have an account that I use to uh, send me an email each day that has all my favorite papers in it all, for all my favorite topics. And uh, a real fun thing that you might do is uh, use ADS to search some of the mentors on the on your course today here because you might see that they have some some recent work. That they uh, that they are a part of, and so that might be a good fun way you can test out ADS. All right, <clears throat> so this was a, a how to uh, find papers and whatnot. Um, there's also uh, a paper reading guide on the week one uh, GitHub page. I'll go ahead and share that with you right now. Uh, so that's right here, uh, paper uh, paper writing or paper writing guide. Maybe it should be paper reading guide. So uh, it just it's basically a paper format, but it has you know how to read papers. So read the summaries, read the abstracts and the conclusions. You know, read the the figure captions. You know, um, for example, it's often easier to omit reading the um, the method section of a paper because it can be very detailed. Uh, and so have a look at this when you uh, before you read the paper that's that's assigned for next week. Um, there, it's linked in week two, and we'll also make sure it's posted on Piazza. Uh, and so that's how you can um, ADS combined with this will get you prepared for reading the paper next week uh, and what, where it will be discussed. And we can we can chat about that online as well. All right, uh, so we're just kind of finishing up here the uh, the last tutorial, and now we're going to transition really quickly into just a brief, um, just a brief little sort of who we are. So uh, Faye and I are going to go first uh, in terms of. Uh, this week, we'll have a, a couple of mentors uh, be online each week to talk about sort of their background in astronomy. Uh, Faye, would you like to go first? Sure. Okay, keep it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Faye. I'm currently a postdoc at Caltech. And similar to many mentors in this workshop, I work in the field of exoplanets. I'm broadly interested in the composition, orbital architecture, and atmospheric loss of exoplanets. So, just a bit about myself. I grew up in China, and uh, at the age of 15, I received a scholarship to study at Singapore for high school. And that's where I got interested in astronomy. I joined the school's astronomy club. And one of the benefits of being near the equator is that you could see almost the entire night sky. So we had an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. 
and we often went on all night long uh, so-called Messier marathons in, in which you try to observe as many Messier objects as possible. So in 2010, I went to University of Cambridge for undergrad, where I also discovered some interest in geology and the evolutionary biology. So I still remember the day during one of our geology class that we had a hands-on session with Martian meteorites. So we could tell the meteorites were from Mars because of the composition and the small air bubbles um, contained almost the same isotopic uh, composition from in situ measurements. And I also remember from one of the biology class, I was totally blown away by a theory called vegeta vegetation rafting. If you haven't heard, of it, heard about this, you should definitely look it up. Very briefly, this says that the monkeys that we see in South America are actually genetic descendants of monkeys in Africa. But there's no fossil records for how these monkeys migrated on land. So the only remaining theory is that the monkeys somehow had to sail the Atlantic back then from Africa to South America on something like a tree trunk. So I was really fascinated by both geology and evolution of biology. And also my long lasting interest in astronomy all led me to the field of exoplanets. Um, so maybe I can share some of my experience about summer projects. So I did my first summer research uh, during my sophomore year. Similar to many of you, I had basically no idea how to code and I do not how to find, I do not know how to find scientific papers. So I actually remember I had to spend a whole week just figuring out how to read a FITS format file uh, uh, during my uh, coding uh, exercise. So that summer I had to spend a lot of time looking up the information that we will cover in this workshop. Um, but during my next year's uh, summer project, I was much more prepared and I could get some science down. Um, so here we are. I'm really glad we are reaching out to many of you. And don't worry if you are totally new to the field or you have no prior coding ex experience. We are started there and we are here to learn together. So just pay attention in class and do the assignments and ask a lot of questions on Piazza. I'm sure you see the future. Sounds good. Thanks, Faye. Appreciate it. Uh, and it's, you know, Faye's just, just one of the many stories that we're gonna hear about how we all were inspired to become astronomers and um, maybe you'll find something you can relate to in all of that. All right. Uh, finally, I'm just gonna say a little bit about uh, how I ended up becoming an astronomer. So I grew up in a small town in Montana in the mountains in the central US. Uh, the skies are really dark there and we used to do a lot of camping and whatnot. And so got up to experience the night sky quite a bit, but it wasn't until I moved to California uh, and went to San Francisco State University that I had an opportunity to go to an astronomical observatory. And, and that was uh, Lick Observatory in Mount Hamilton. I'll send, a, I'll send a little link here that shows a live webcam. Uh, that's a pretty cool, it's a really a, an amazing place to, to visit. It's sort of a, sort of a place where it's like, it's like kind of stepping back in time. Uh, and it, I was really taken by it. And I spent a lot of time here as an undergraduate, uh, but, but it's, it's more than just that. So before I ever visited Lick Observatory, uh, I was working at my university and I, the, first, the first project I ever had was literally copying data from CDs to DVDs. So it would take up less space on the shelf. So it was a very modest project to get me started. Uh, I moved right into something equally interesting when I was editing log sheets of the nights that were observed uh, and looking at the, the stars that were on the list. And uh, it was it was a slow road to get to the observatory, Lick Observatory, uh, where I began to stay up all night uh, collecting data on a, a 0 0.9 meter telescope called the CAT, the Coudé Auxiliary Telescope. It's, it's a small telescope attached to the main telescope at Lick Observatory, the three meter telescope. And I was taken. I just thought I was here. I was up all night while everyone else was sleeping, collecting data that would be used to look for planets around other stars. It was it really blew me away. And I, I from that first night on, I was hooked and I made my uh, my main experience as a researcher 
um, someone who collected data and knew knew what the data was about when um, other people couldn't have done things like done theoretical work or um, planning of different sorts of surveys. Uh, I've spent almost all of my time pointing the telescope and collecting a single star's worth of observation at a time. So after I uh, finished my work at San Francisco State, uh, doing a little bit of research and writing a thesis there, I moved on to UC Berkeley uh, and I got an upgrade in my job. They started paying me a little bit, which was really great. And uh, I got a bigger telescope. So I got to go to the Keck telescope. And um, here's a, a link to Keck Observatory, which is where um, I spend a lot of my time uh, intellectually thinking about it. I don't, I've been there before, but I don't actually spend a lot of time there. And um, there's a wonderful website called the Mauna Kea Weather Center where you can peek in and look at the weather there. And uh, over the course of the last uh, 12 years, I've spent over 400 nights collecting data on the telescope, um, all remotely through similar Zoom meetings like this and with um, VNC connections, virtual network connections, where I can control the telescope and the instrument from, from work. And uh, it's that's uh, collecting data at the telescope and, and being a part of the science that and, you know end up on the archive, that end up in newspapers, that ends up in textbooks, uh, has really been a special part of what um, I sort of take as my own astronomy identity. And I was telling everyone, one of my favorite things to share with people uh, in astronomy or outside of astronomy is that when you're at the telescope, for example, and you crunch that little bit of data, you run that little bit of reduction routine, for a little while, you, you may know something that no one else in the world knows because no one else has this data, no one has access to it. They've, it hasn't been plotted up. It hasn't been written in a paper. It hasn't been refereed or put in a press release or anything else. It's just uh, that little bit of knowledge that will someday get out into the world, but for now is, is just your, your bit of knowledge. And that was, that's a really special, um, a really special thing for me. So um, that's it for this week. Uh, stay tuned for next week. Uh, if you feel like the, this was, was too easy for you this week, stay tuned. We have many challenging topics ahead. If you feel like it was um, too difficult, then um, work really hard to get caught up. We can all do this together via Piazza with all of our help mentors and our fellow students helping us along. Um, I really appreciate everyone coming today and especially a thank you to Joey, Chitan and Priya who did led the tutorials. There'll be more tutorials next week. Stay tuned, stay safe. Thanks everybody.